segregation crimes. Briefly, after for reparations, special measures must also be taken into account. Special measures is a wide range of policies that may not normally be introduced. However, because of the severity of the harms and the injury, they become absolutely necessary under international law. In addition, special measures requires the collaboration of all governmental instruments and bodies. Thus, I have attempted to lay out broad, but also specific guidelines for the duty of this task force. It is needless to say that your work will inform the federal government as well as local and other state reparatory justice efforts around the country. And COBRA is committed to encouraging synchronistic actions in these reparatory efforts. You have added in our mission by basing your legislation on HR 40, on which other municipalities and states have followed. And COBRA is here for continued assistance to this task force every step of the way going forward. And with that, I would say, Asante Sana, many thanks for the justice work you have engaged and for allowing Incobra to offer our aid. A Luda Continua, Pomoja Tashendi, and Mili Shaka. The struggle continues. Together, we will be victorious. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Howard, for your expert testimony. We will now go to Professor Roy Brooks. Roy Brooks, Professor Roy Brooks, you are recognized. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, perhaps I should say a bit more about my background before I go through my statement. And I'm just going to highlight uh, aspects of the statement. I assume that people have already read that. Uh, I graduated from, uh, from Yale Law School, uh, where I served as, as an editor of the Yale Law Journal. When graduating from law school, I clerked for a federal judge. And then I worked for a time as a corporate lawyer on Wall Street at the firm of Cravath, Swain and Moore before becoming a law professor at the University of San Diego Law School. And I've, I'm in my 43rd year of teaching, uh, both uh, at the University of San Diego and at uh, uh, another school, actually two, two other schools. And during that time, I produced with the help of some very capable students uh, over uh, 20 books and 100 uh, articles. Uh, the last uh, 25 years, I've been focusing on um, past atrocities and post-conflict justice, writing a few books and several uh, articles on that. Uh, and I got into this, this, this the study of, of, of past uh, atrocities of redress, and, and I do refer to it as redress rather than reparations, because reparations is just one way of responding to a past atrocity, one way of effectuating post-conflict justice. There are others, and I talk about that in my, my statement. Uh, uh, I, an editor of an academic press asked me if I would look at the matter of uh, reparations. This was in the mid-1990s. Uh, and I rejected that uh, because I thought that the notion was rather uh, foolish and, uh, and that there was really nothing to be gained from spending time and effort on that. Uh, but, but then he proposed that I look at it from an international perspective, uh, which I did, and spent a great deal of time and a number of years uh, traveling the globe, basically, and uh, presenting papers and studying uh, with study groups around the world uh, in, in Poland, uh, in Copenhagen, Hagen. Uh, and uh, I saw there, looking at the various ways in which uh, governments responded to their past atrocities, that there were some best practices. And one of the practices is the one that I prefer, which is the uh, atonement model. But before I get into that, what I'd like to do is to just sort of uh, go through and to highlight uh, uh, various components of the international redress movement. I think that there are conceptual tools there, as well as experiences, which can greatly help us think through this complicated question of redress and uh, slavery. Um, there are two basic methods, and, and understand we're talking about civil redress, not criminal redress. There are two basic ways of pursuing civil redress. One is 
what I term the tort model, the other is the atonement model. Uh, the tort model is uh, backward looking, it is uh, victim focused, and it is compensatory. That is to say, its main purpose is to seek uh, compensatory justice and sometimes uh, punitive justice. Uh, and that is sort of the received tradition. It certainly was a received tradition when I came on the scene in the mid 1990s. Uh, the competing model, which I saw uh, in international uh, experiences, is the atonement model. And that model, in contrast to the uh, tort model, is forward looking, it is uh, perpetrator focused, and it is restorative. In other words, its primary mission is to seek restorative uh, justice. And restorative justice means restoring uh, a broken relationship between the victims and the perpetrator of an atrocity, and also to give the perpetrator of an atrocity the opportunity to restore its moral character in the aftermath of the, uh, the atrocity. Uh, and the atonement model has uh, two components. Uh, one is atonement and the other is forgiveness. Uh, atonement is the perpetrator side of the equation and that requires the perpetrator to issue a genuine apology. And there are various ways of defining that term, which I can do and which I do do in the statement. I'd be happy to elaborate on that. Uh, and also to make the apology believable by doing a redemptive act. And that redemptive act is a reparation. So the concept of reparation on the, uh, under the atonement model is quite different from the concept of reparation under the tort model. Under the atonement model, the purpose of the reparation uh, is to make the apology believable to concretize the apology. And so the sincerity of the apology is calculated by the weight of the reparations. Uh, uh, and I think that's quite important. And once the a sufficient atonement, that is to say apology plus reparations has been tendered by the perpetrator, then the question of forgiveness arrives on the victim's desk uh, kind of like a subpoena, a civic one, not a moral one, because there's no moral uh, obligation attached to the victims here. It attaches to the perpetrator. And um, the question of how does one manifest forgiveness or whether one should, that is a question that the victims have to determine. I do not get into that in my uh, statement because I was asked to focus basically on the the perpetrator. Um, so uh, you have the atonement model and versus uh, the tort model. And then there are reparations. Uh, there are various types of reparations. There are compensatory reparations, which are reparations that go to the victim or the victim's family. These can be cash or non-cash reparations. Uh, and then there are rehabilitative reparations. And these are cash or non-cash uh, uh, reparations that go to the victim's community. They're designed to rebuild the community in, in, the, uh, in the aftermath of the uh, atrocity. They are asset building reparations. They're quite different from the compensatory reparations. Now, um, I prefer, uh, as I said, the, the, the atonement model, not because it's something that I sort of came up with, but I think it is superior to the tort model. And uh, that can be seen with the following example. Let us suppose that you are standing on the street and some stranger or someone even that you know walks by and steps on your foot and looks back at you and keeps going, doesn't apologize. How insulting is that? Uh, and it seems to me that uh, redress ought to be about uh, about the dignity uh, that has been visited upon the victims. It ought to be about a reconciliation, uh, making this society better, making our state better. Uh, it ought to be about uh, elevating 
uh, our humanity as, as a people. Uh, so that is why I prefer the atonement model to the tort model. Um, in terms of reparations, I am not in favor of um, compensatory reparations uh, because they are so complicated. So, for example, uh, most reparations, contemporary, uh, uh, compensatory reparations, are direct cash payments. Well, the individual can take that and, you know, gamble, go, go to Las Vegas to gamble it away. Um, and that gives evidence to Chris Rock's famous uh, quip that the only one who is going to benefit from reparations is Kentucky Fried Chicken. And I can tell you the experience in South Africa, talking with the attorneys there and working with the attorneys there on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, which I did, and also uh, talking with attorneys who have represented victims there uh, and speaking with them at international conferences. And they tell me that uh, after one year, the victims are poor again. Uh, the Now, the solution to that some would say well let's have uh, conditional cash payments uh meaning that you can only use the money for certain purposes that is morally reprehensible in the view of many individuals including myself because you're denying agency to the victims uh and we don't do that with anyone else who receives um a compensation from an injury uh so the other problem with um with the uh, with uh, compensatory reparations is that they are very very difficult to formulate, difficult to administer, uh, and difficult to determine who gets them and who does not. Uh, so uh, for all of those reasons, I do uh, propose and recommend strongly rehabilitative reparations, but I do not suggest that you provide a hodgepodge of uh, rehabilitative reparations. In other words, you should focus on one or two important items. And in the paper, my, my statement, I recommend boarding schools as, as a focus. And why? Well, because boarding schools are foundational. Uh, once you get a, a good education, it opens up all kinds of opportunities. There are so, socioeconomic benefits that derive from that. I look at the African American uh, students who were my classmates at Yale Law School, uh, including one Clarence Thomas, and all of them have done well uh, economically, social economically, and more importantly, their children and grandchildren have done well. Uh, they've gone to very good schools and they've gotten very good jobs, and I think that that's foundational. The other reason why I would focus on boarding schools and education in general and is because what we've learned from uh, Thurgood Marshall and the Legal Defense Fund is that focusing on education is a very good way to uh, to attack racial injustice. It's sort of a leader uh, in the vanguard of the attack because it's very hard to argue against uh, education, quality education. Uh, so I mean, so for so for these reasons, I do recommend boarding schools that would be located throughout the state of California uh, in green belts, that is to say, not in the city, but outside of the cities. And uh, one thing to understand about education is that education takes place less in the classroom than at home doing homework. That's where it takes place. And uh, my daughter who attended Princeton uh, had uh, the, the, the Princeton had the system where they would have tutors available at 12 midnight, at two in the morning for students. Uh, and that is the sort of thing that I think a boarding school could do, It'd be a total environment which, we, which would be conducive to a quality education. And with that, I think my time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Brooks, for your expert testimony. At this time, we are going to take comments and questions from the task force. I'll begin. I have, I have a question for Mr. Howard and a comment slash question for Professor Brooks. So my, my question to Mr. Howard it, it relates to uh, Evanston and the local reparations model. Um, 
you know, Evanston made news recently for being, you know, the first in the nation local reparations model whereby uh, Black Americans, and you can, ex uh, you can expand on this, Mr. Howard, because I'm sure you know more than me, um, receive reparations in the form of housing vouchers, um, which is extremely significant. Uh, but there was also some criticism that, um, you know, the Evanston model wasn't as comprehensive as it could be. So my, my more pointed question is, how do you have any suggestions or recommendations for how California, the state of California, can improve upon the Evanston model? And my question or comment to, to, to Professor Brooks, um, you know, thank you. Um, in reading your material, materials, you know, I, I found it to be quite interesting and informative. Um, I did not see any reference to uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken in your comments. Um, my, 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 um, you know, I have a concern because when we when we talk about compensation, I just wanted to make it clear my opinion that you know, and we don't. This is we we haven't gotten to the point where we're actually proposing recommendations for what reparations could look like. But I would just like to say. You know, in the event that compensation is, you know, provided, I just want to put on record, I think it's problematic to say that Black Americans who descend from child slavery here in the United States would just earn and spend it on frivolous things. Um, you know, there's even data to, to support that Black Americans out of all Americans in this country, we save the most, despite having the least. And so I, I kind of want to get away from this notion that, you know, Black Americans are, you know, just financially illiterate. And, you know, once, you know, reparations are there, they won't have the wherewithal to do, uh, to build their communities or to, or to build their families. So I don't know if you could maybe, I, I don't know if you want to expand on that, but I just wanted to make a comment um, in relation yeah. to that. Because Sure, I'll respond to that. And I can also show you in the paper, it's on page 23. It's a re uh, this notion about Kentucky Fried Chicken, it's not mine, it's Chris Rock's, okay? It's not mine, so I just put it in there. But John Cook's experience in South Africa, I think, is, is very real. And the, the problem is, it's not so much, you know, that uh, black people, and, that, and then again, that's, I want to get away from that notion, notion that black people can't be responsible. That's not, the, 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 that's not, that's not really the, the main point there. Main point is that these uh, reparations are going to be so small; they're going to be modest. They're not going to do much. They they don't do much anywhere where they've been given. You know, so for example, Japanese American survivors got um, uh, twenty thousand dollars each in in terms of, of reparations and all. It's a one-time payment. That's it. Uh, if you want to do a continuous payment, uh, you know, I sort of have models for that. Uh, but then that becomes problematic because how do you administer that? Uh, uh, and the point here, the larger point, don't miss the larger point here, because the larger point is this, is that if you, there are various ways of doing this. If you complicate this, then you give the proponents, um, I'm sorry, the, the opponents, the opponents of reparations ammunition to say, well, look, I want to do this, but it's just too complicated. And they raise questions. What about this? What about that? What that? And, and you don't go anywhere. You get bogged down in their, in, in, in their issues. Uh, but if you make it straightforward and if you use the precedence that we have with education and the legal defense fund, I think you're going to get opposition, but you have less uh you know co complications and you have a you i think your your grounds your moral grounds are a, a much clearer so did would you Thank like you. for me to um, just um, yes mr howard and then i'll recognize vice chair brown so mr howard if you. you can address my question thank you sure so the evanston model uh <laughs> just speaking to that uh compensation model that was just stated uh question the evanston model immediately infuses $25,000 into the asset com column of any one of the uh, recipients of the, of the housing initiative. $25,000 in wealth that they didn't have prior to this. So it's an instant contribution of wealth uh, to the family and wealth that will be held in a home that could be utilized 10, 15, 20 years down the line and will continue to build wealth on into the future. So there's many ways you can do compensation and certainly Evanston is a great example of that. 
Uh, I was in Evanston uh, as a member of the National African American Reparations Commission in November of last year. And we were there to quote unquote certify the Evanston model as a national model to emulate. And three minimum criteria in that certification came out. One is that the injured parties must be the ones who determine what reparations are. You can't go into a community and say this is local reparations and the injured, meaning uh, African descendants, black descendants of enslavement, are not the ones who determine what the reparative initiatives are in any location. Second, it is the injured party that has to control and direct the resources once those resources are allotted. And thirdly, that the policy cannot be ordinary public policy. I see what you're doing with the uh, anchor groups, uh, with the, uh, I think, Bunch uh, Center, as part of that process of building that, what we call stakeholder authority amongst the local uh, parties in that particular location. Evanston has a local stakeholders authority, which informs their, com their committee and task force or their committee reparations committee to what the people say is necessary, the priorities of repair that the people are asking for. I think what you're doing by institutionalizing it with the Bunch Center is totally on point and will provide guidance for the, uh, for the nation going forward. Thank you, Mr. Howard. I would like to um, recognize Vice Chair Brown. You're recognized. Madam Chair, members of the task force. Dr. Roy Brooks. I wanted to shout and run around my house for that definitive statement that you gave about atonement, reckoning, and showing some fruits of repentance. As for me and, and my position, education ought to be up at the top. Ignorance is not blissful. Ignorance is dangerous. And if we look at the history of what our oppressors did to us, they made sure that we would not be enlightened. Even we had ancestors who dug what they call pit schools out in the woods, out in the brush harbors, and they learned how to read and write by candlelight and kerosene light. So we have these other areas, yes. But that's the reason why earlier I raised a question when we were discussing the basic groups that we would have involved, that our alliance of black school educators ought to be definitely involved in not just conversation, but in the conduct I get nervous when I hear all this talk about conversation. I know we got to talk, but as my teacher and friend, Dr. Martin Luther King once said, my God, there are times when we make things a paralysis of an analysis. And what we need is practical, sensible steps that can be held accountable. And in that area of education, my brother, you have a winner there and you have a friend as a member of this task force. Thank you so much for your brilliant presentation. Member Holder, you are recognized. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, both experts, Mr. Howard and Dr. Brooks, uh, for your presentation and for providing us with these, uh, a variety of conceptual frameworks for thinking about the strategies that we would like to present and thinking about issues of implementation. I don't want to take up a lot of time. I want to get to my questions because I feel like we should be hearing from the speakers right now and um, uh, you know, utilizing your expertise in this moment. I do have a quick comment and then a question that I'd like to direct toward uh, Mr. Howard. Um, I just want to start off and, and quote uh, President Kennedy when he was talking about the mission to the moon, his comments at Rice University 
when he said, you know, anticipating the opposition about implementation and how difficult it's going to be to go to the moon and what's the point of paying billions of dollars to go to the moon. He said, we do this, that, and the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And this is a hard undertaking to undo 400 years of damage, 400 years of crimes against humanity. It's a, it, it is hard, and we are doing these things because they are hard. So I don't want issues of implementation to govern our conversations about uh, reparations and the moral repair that it represents. I want to direct a question to Mr. Howard. I was very interested in what you had to say about peoplehood. I'd ask for you to expand on that a little bit. And I would also, when you talk to us about peoplehood, I'd like for your comments to also be informed by this notion of individual cash payments and how that form of reparations, not as an exclusive form, but as one form of reparations, how that uh, gels with the notion of peoplehood and also the notion of satisfaction that you mentioned. Thank you for that question and thank you for that quote as well. And you're absolutely correct. This is an extremely difficult undertaking for anyone to, to, uh, to undertake, uh, to admit uh, to, uh, it, to bring repair to people whose injury is generational and will last more generations, uh, even with repairative initiatives like these that should come out of this task force. Uh, these are generational harms, it's gonna take generations to repair them. So again, I agree totally that this is a very difficult undertaking. And COBRA looks at uh, peoplehood, similarly to, I think someone referenced the uh, 20 or so uh, clergymen uh, that um, General Sturman met with uh, that came, that resulted in the 40 acres and a mule. Uh, they asked, they were, they were uh, asked whether or not what did they think they needed to be free? And they said, land, of course. And then they were asked that they want that land to be in the monks of uh, white America, or that they want that land amongst themselves. And 95% uh, or 19 out of 20 said they wanted to be amongst themselves. They wanted to build their own communities, yes. their own culture, their own na nation, if you will. So people who looks into the whole idea of sovereignty, looks into self-determination, looks into collective control over your resources, over your institutions, and that nature. And so that was what we, we lost as a people in this country. That was what was taken away from us. Our language, culture, our ability to self-govern, those things have to be part of our repair. Satisfaction looks at return of our dignity to us. To be governed and to think that the only way we can, we can succeed in any, in any group construct is by being 100% tied to someone who's harmed us for 400 years is a, is a, is, is a pathological concept. Yes. We have the ability, and we came to this country with the ability to self-govern, and we did so at the highest level in history. Some of our governments that we had prior to coming to America were in a much higher moral standing than America is today. And so part of, part of that, uh, Peoplehood is to get back to that understanding that we can collectively govern and solve our own issues if given the right resources, the right uh, time, and the and the right uh, will, we can do those type of things. Uh, when it comes to individual payments as part of peoplehood, historically, Black people in this country have utilized our resources in a collective manner. Mm -hmm. That's historically. We wouldn't have the black churches. We wouldn't have historical black institutions. We wouldn't have the 5,000 banks that we had from 1904 to probably 1930 
if it wasn't for black people collectively utilizing our resources. I'm of the belief that if we're given compensation in the form of individual direct payments, 25 to 35 percent of us, and I don't know where I'm getting that number from, but, I, but I'm saying a, a significant number of us would collectively pull our resources to build community that we once had in this country that was only removed with the advent, with the event of dumping drugs into our community, primarily with crack cocaine in this country that began to deteriorate our sense of community, which again is one of those post Jim Crow crimes that would have been committed against us. And we need to look at how devastating our communities are as a result of crack cocaine, that particular injury. But certainly if cash direct payments were given to us as a people, I'm under the belief that we will utilize them in a collective manner because that is also part of our culture. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Are there any, are there some questions from the task force members at this time? Um, I can see everyone. I had a question for Roy Brooks, Professor Brooks. Oh, sorry, Reggie Jones, sorry, I see your hand. You are recognized. Professor Brooks, uh, from a legal standpoint, if, if you look at, uh, and I think you've kind of addressed some of it, really kind of our legal standing. As we all know, colonizers came in and took, take away land and then used the natural resources to benefit themselves. Uh, they did in Africa, they did in Native, Native Americans here. In addition, when wealth is really defined by land, that wealth gap is that the fact that that there were laws in the books that DIs who fought for this country weren't able to buy in white neighborhoods or that we had redlining or that banks wouldn't lend to us and that insurance company wouldn't give us insurance for housing. It, can we make a case, a, a legal case, that um, we should we should have some kind of um, a program or something that that specifically talks about getting land back to African Americans so we can help close the wealth gap. That's, it's, it's, you kind of said it in, in a way that we need to do things that will build generational wealth or build generational education that will build the, the black community so that we can at least be equal with our white counterparts and so that we can move ahead and, and compete on a, on a level basis. Does that make any legal sense? Yeah, the the problem is that, uh, and this is the case with most atrocities, past atrocities, and again we're talking about past atrocities, um, that they were legal when they took place. So slavery mm -hmm. was legal under United States law, the Constitution, and statutory law. You know, uh, so. Uh, and indeed, in the Dred Scott case, Chief Justice Taney of the Supreme Court said that the uh, black man has no rights which the white man is bound to respect. Uh, and that's broad. There were some uh, state court uh, judges, justices, like in North Carolina, which sort of drew a distinction between the written law and the unwritten law. That is to say, the constitutional law, statutory law, and the common law, and under the common law, the slaves had some uh, some rights. Uh, they had the right not to be killed, for example. Uh, you can work them to death, but you couldn't outright kill them. Uh, this was under some interpretations of the, the common law. Uh, and the problem now that any effort to redress a past atrocity here in the United States has is the Supreme Court. Uh, because your uh, your um, redress is going to be redress by definition is asymmetrical. In other words, it only um, it only includes, it only involves, it only targets the victims of the atrocities. Japanese Americans receive uh, redress for their internment during the Second World War. African Americans are not entitled to that redress because we weren't victimized by that particular atrocity. So that's how it works. And I might also say as a footnote that these asymmetrical measures do not repeal 
or obviate the need for ongoing civil rights laws. We're still going to need them. Okay, and these measures are sort of a, uh, they're not asymmetrical, they are symmetrical. They are applicable to, uh, to more, more than just, uh, say, African Americans. Uh, whites have uh, Title VII uh, rights, for example. So, uh, yeah, so that, that's the problem. But I think, I think that the, 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 there's a way around this. Uh, I don't know, you know, it has to be tested that I give in a paper, and that is that I suggest that the redress should be directed not on the basis of race, but on the basis of a, a connection to slavery, that is, say, an enslaved descendant. And uh, there is ample research out there that shows about 300,000 slaves in America in the 17th and 18th century were white. You know, we call some of them indentured servants, but they died in their servitude at all, and they certainly saw themselves as as, uh, as slaves. So there's some very powerful scholarship on that. And so if you base your re your redress on slave descendants, that is to say, the individuals would have to uh, show some connection to uh, slavery. Uh, that gets away from the Supreme Court's rather restrictive interpretation of the 14th Amendment, which would prevent any kind of race conscious. Now, uh, uh, th that's where the Supreme Court is going. Right now, it does allow for race conscious measures uh, in response to the institution's own past discrimination. Okay, uh, uh, but that's going the, with the current Supreme Court. That's going by the wayside. I would make the argument that that your report, that any uh, statement on uh, redress for slavery, ought to have a protest statement in there. In other words, to say that the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Constitution, which would make which makes redress difficult because people say, well, why don't you just say, we're talking about blacks, aren't we? Why don't we do, well, we, we are, but we can't. The Supreme Court won't allow that. And the Supreme Court's interpretation is the is sequel to in the present day embodiment of these corrupt laws that allow slavery to exist in the first place. So I would, I would not go into the night silent. I would, uh, I would protest. I would put that in, in, in as my statement and say that this is simply the a present day embodiment of these corrupt laws that made the atrocities possible in the first place. But that's a that's a big problem that you're going to have dealing with that, and uh, and in, in particular with respect to land. Uh, Native Americans have tried that. The Supreme Court that won't allow that. South Africa, that's the big issue there about land because that's what the South African, the Black South Africans want. That there's resistance there too. Uh, so, and I would just say, just sort of to, to, to conclude on this particular point, there's an old saying that you don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. You can't, you know, so if you have a measure, if you can get something, get it. And it, and, and it doesn't mean, and I, I'm the last person that would say that at this stage you ought to take into account the political calculations because that's not how civil rights thinking and scholarship go. Uh, if that were the case, then uh, we would not have had abolitionists talk about ending slavery when they knew it was politically impossible. We would not have had civil rights lawyers in the 1920s and 30s and 40s talking about equal rights when they knew that that was not possible. Uh, the job of the civil rights scholar, the civil rights thinker, is to determine the moral direction in which the society should go, to, to set the moral compass of society and fight like hell to bring that about. And you make that statement before you get into the horse trade, which is the political process. At least you know where you want to go and where the country should go. And you may not get all of that because of the political process, but you have that statement out there. It was important that we had abolitionists advocating for the end of slavery. Uh, that statement is out there. That statement is out there. Thank you. Member Scott Lewis, you are recognized. Thank you, Chairperson Moore. Mr. Roy Brooks, I would be interested in, in hearing from you um, your thoughts about how say, an atonement model 
would you know respond not just to the issue of injury but also to the related um, matter of the benefits the of the injuries of slavery jim crow etc so i think you know what what i'm there's more than just an issue of the the injury but that that injury was was financially beneficial to who, you know we can consider a whole host of of entities who benefited but it's important to remember that slavery right was an economic system not just purely a political or and so even to, to this very day we have you know institutions who you know financially benefited from the foundational injuries that was the economic system of labor and how we can get I, I see some of representation showing up in in Mr. Howard, but I am interested how atonement might actually respond to the actual benefit of, of injury. Benefit here meaning the financial the financial benefit. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think that redress ought to take into account the lingering effects of the atrocity. Okay, that's yeah, that's the main way of responding to the atrocity. Uh, and that hence my recommendation of boarding schools. Uh, and you know, your um, the, the atonement model, what it does, it places the burden of redress on the perpetrator, not the victim. Under the tort model, it's on the victim. The victim has to do all the damn work. But under the atonement model, it's the perpetrator that does the work. Uh, you know, if you're going to, you know, if this is, if you're saying you're sorry, if this is a genuine apology, well, show it, okay? Oh. And, and propose it, and you can make, well, now nah, we don't like that. We, we, let's, we're having a negotiation. Let's do something more. You know, that's not, that's the way the process ought to work, as opposed to having the victims who don't have the resources. I mean, this is unusual that a state government agency is putting resources into studying this. Use it. The victims don't have the resources to come up with an appropriate uh, reparations. They know what the pain is. Uh, and uh, so, uh, what the atonement model does, it places the um, burden on the perpetrator and it says, look, what we're trying to do here is to make this a better society. We're trying to elevate the humanity of our society. What's wrong with talking about reparations in those terms, you know, in high-minded terms, you know, as opposed to saying, ah, just give me the money. And 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 I can tell you this, that a check of $25,000, one time, that ain't going to, that, that's not going to return the victims to the status quo ante. When you're talking about atrocities, nothing really can return the victims to the status quo ante. Uh, the, uh, just this week in San Diego alone, there were two meetings of Japanese Americans still talking about the internment. And this is uh, 30 years after they received reparations, this wasn't enough. What they got wasn't enough. It doesn't, it's nothing is, is going to return the victim to the status quo ante. And that is the underlying, I think, uh, um, folly of the, the tort model, the thing that, that a cash payment to the victims is going to be sufficient. And I can tell you, having been around the world and around this country talking with individuals about this, the conservatives are going to say, yeah, I'll buy that. And it's all over. You can't talk about race anymore. Okay, here's your money. That's it. Deals closed. It's a settlement. It's a settlement. And the way settlements work in the law is that the defendant doesn't admit to liability. Yeah. Okay, you end the matter and it works to the benefit of the defendant. It works to the benefit of the perpetrator. You're letting the perpetrator off the hook by going in that direction. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Member Tamaki, you're recognized. It's just very briefly, uh, with that, and without commenting basically in what uh, the task force should do. Just speaking of the Japanese American reparations effort, it was an atonement model, and I can tell you how controversial it was. Uh, and it was controversial because it didn't even approximate the actual harm of uh, people who lost their lives and who lost their property. And um, 
it boiled down to the point of how to make the apology concrete and meaningful. And um, there were some who said, you know, they can never compensate me. I won't take a penny. The harm is irreparable. Uh, there were others who basically said, uh, in order for the apology to, to be meaningful, it's got to be a significant number. And basically, the $20,000 uh, determination was a, it was a wild ass guess. I mean, it was a number. It wasn't based on anything. Hmm. And, uh, but to this day, you know, I have to say for many of the people who are still alive, uh, they kind of, you know, they, they cared more about the apology and the recognition and the acknowledgement of the harm than they did the actual money because the money didn't really approximate what they lost. Um, but I'm not saying that that experience is at all equivalent uh, to what black people have suffered in America. I'm just only saying that was a huge controversy uh, in the Japanese American community to the point that people didn't talk to each other. They were so angry about um, uh, the outcome. But in passage of 40 years, there is a consensus that that acknowledgement was a good thing for the country. So I'll leave it at that, but um, it, it, that if you, we look at the Japanese American model, it was an atonement model, wasn't a, wasn't a compensatory model. That's interesting. Thank you for that, Member Tamaki. Member Holder, you're recognized. A question for Dr. Brooks um, regarding the atonement model. Uh, you know, I'm also, uh, I'm a civil rights attorney and a litigator. I don't want to get too wonky in my questioning right now, but I do have a question of, about your comments about the Supreme Court and how this is going to pass muster uh, and judicial scrutiny. Um, specifically, I want to know if in, if in, if you've given thought to this, this notion of atonement, the moral betterment of society, if that's the basis for reparations. Is that the type of basis that could meet strict scrutiny? Because as we know, you know, a government, governments can do certain things, you know, under equal protection, under the equal protection framework, if it can meet strict scrutiny, which is a standard that is extremely onerous. We all know that. But I'm wondering if there are any cases that have looked at moral atonement as the basis for a government policy and come out on the other side saying that meets strict scrutiny because it makes us better as a society. Well, I, if only the Supreme Court would think like that. We, we, our society would be much better off. I am not aware of any cases uh, where that has happened. As a matter of fact, uh, in focus on what's coming down you know, the road here, as opposed to what is behind us, the Supreme Court is moving in the opposite direction. Uh, because uh, as, I, as I indicated earlier, it was that you could pass a strict scrutiny if the race conscious um, uh, program was designed to compensate for your own past discrimination, okay? And, the, and this is how many of the affirmative action programs were set up, and so that the victims, uh, the, the beneficiaries of the program were not necessarily the victims of the institution's own past discrimination. That was really nice. But now what the court is saying, what the members of the court uh, are going uh, uh, for is that strict scrutiny means that, yes, you can um, compensate for your own past discrimination, you know, that will meet the constitutional ends test. But the means test is that you have to do with non uh, race conscious remedies. Okay, so you would have to do it with race neutral remedies. You could not, in affirmative action, which is basically what you're do doing here, it's, a, it's really so when I say asymmetrical, it's, a, it's, a, it's affirmative action uh, structurally. Uh, that that's not going to happen. They're, they're saying, and 
the, the, the way in which they're going is that, yes, we want to do something about discrimination. We don't like discrimination and past discrimination, yes, but your remedy has to be race neutral, okay? Uh, two wrongs don't make a right. That's the thinking there. Uh, and it's not only the, the Constitution, but you also have Prop 209 to deal with. And it's the same kind of hurdle. And I think the way to, to get around this, and uh, I have the benefit of having law students who are thinking about this in the context of my class. And they looked at, they're looking at this, the very issue that you're looking at, but they have uh, uh, other tools to, to use. And uh, just generally thinking about how do you get how can you be progressive with this Supreme Court? And the way to do it is to try to find race neutral means which will uh, get you to where you want to go. So for example, in New Haven, Connecticut, this was after the Ritchie case where the Supreme Court said that you could not use race conscious measures uh, to um, uh, to compensate for you know, your own past discrimination. This has to do with a slightly different matter, but 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 that was the basic notion, the basic norm that the Supreme Court was working with. So what the city of New Haven did subsequently is that they, because what they wanted to do was to uh, to uh, bring more minorities uh, into the command structure of their police and fire departments. So what they did in a city which is 60% minority, they gave a preference to people who live there. So the preference was race neutral. It was based upon residency, not upon race. And now most of the command structure in New Haven is minority. Okay, so you achieve this progressive end working within the system that the Supreme Court has created for you. But I really think that it is important to have a statement of protest in there to say, hey, what you are doing, Supreme Court, is you are basically uh, that you, what you're doing is really sequel to the laws which enable this atrocity to take place in the, uh, and, um, in, in the first place. Okay. Thank if you. I, I have one. one. Go ahead, Mr. Howard. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, one of the reasons we use international norms and international law because it, it's it's expanded beyond civil rights law in this country. And we get boggled down in the civil rights law framework, then we're gonna always be on the losing end. And so we use terms like crimes against humanity. Look, you use terms like African descendants. African descendant is a specific international designation of people who were robbed from the African continent during a multi-country criminal enterprise that they call trade, shipped all over the West, and submitted to all forms of economic exploitation and abuse and crime and more crimes, and their descendants today still are injured as a result of those crimes. That's the framework. I stated earlier that I'm an advisor of the African American Redress Network with Thurgood Marshall Law School at Howard University and the Human Rights Center of, of Columbia University. We are positioning ourselves to deal with this issue in Evanston because there are people who are saying that this is race-based. We're saying that this is a crime-based, harm-based remedy to a particular people who crimes were addressed to. The fact that they were of African descent, that's secondary and it, and it, and it, and it wipes away this notion that white people were enslaved and they should also be, you know, uh, uh, included into this 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 uh, body of redress because the people who this legislation is for are people who have a history of criminal activities directed toward them by this particular government and so the 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 the, the argument moves away from this is a race based issue to a crime based issue and we think that we can uh, make sure we think that we can we can we can win on that particular level because America is a signature of several international documents from which this language is encoded. And so they have to listen to this language and they have to utilize in some of their deliberations, whether they do or they don't, it's, 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 it's another thing, but we can base that argument. And so I wouldn't look at trying to narrowly focus on, you know, uh, strict scrutiny or, um, 
that this has to pass, you know, some other non-race-based test. The key here is there are African descendants in America, and that designation brings with it a whole lot. It's the same thing as if you have a refugee and a political asylum seeker as opposed to an immigrant. There are two different designations or three different designations that has a body of law wrapped around each one of those. There's different laws that are directed toward political asylum seekers or political prisoners than they are regular prisoners or regular immigrants into a country. And so we have to step outside of this framework that we've been imprisoned by over the last uh, several hundred years in civil rights law. Can I, can I say something? I, I have to leave at 12 because I have a class, but I do wanted to say some, something in uh, response to Mr. Howard. Uh, the, the critical point is this, is that slavery was legal uh, in the United States and even under international law at the time that it happened. It did not become illegal under international law until a convention in uh, 1898 and then really a uh, convention, I think it was in 1920, 1923. Uh, and also, there are any number of doctrines in international law which cut off liability for succeeding regimes. That, that says you're not responsible for what happened there. There are, there are several doctrines in international law. And chapter four of the book, Atonement and Forgiveness, talks about those. Uh, and the, the last point I want to make is that you cannot ignore domestic law. I mean, international law really means nothing in domestic courts unless the Supreme Court recognizes it. And, and so right now, the strict scrutiny test, that is where we are. And that's what you have to play with. And as a lawyer, I would say that I would not go into any court arguing other than the strict scrutiny. And there are ways around it, okay? And even, uh, you know, Mr. Howard's uh, indication that they were moving, that it's not race conscious, that's kind of an indication that, uh, th that, that one should try to frame this uh, under protest, again, under protest, try to frame this in sort of race neutral ways. Um, I, I am so sorry, but I do, if I'm not, uh, and, and actually the class I am going into is looking at a lot of these things that you're looking at. It's my class on international redress, and I need to get there uh, in time. If I don't, my, my students will, 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 will knock down my door here and drag me into the classroom. Uh, so I'm sorry, I have to leave now, but I do. Um, Madam Chair. Vice Chair Brown, you are recognized. Mr. Brooks, Dr. Yes. Brooks. Yes, sir. Before you go, I, I can appreciate the global picture that Dr. Howe was presenting, yes dealing with the human family, yes. But the scene of the crime that we're dealing with is the state of California. And we have specificities of what was done in California. Under Peter Barnett, the first governor, we have specificities in California of that case of R.C. Lee, 1857, 1858. That's exact, that's definite. We have specifics of what redevelopment, so-called redevelopment agencies did in the last 50 years plus to dislocate black folks. We got to quantify and localize a lot of this stuff about reparations and getting reckoning and redemption to specifics. If you're gonna get people turned on to what you want, that's where I'm coming from personally. Let's be specific. Let's be rational. Let's be definite. And then you can nail them. You're not going to convince these folks. Their hearts ain't going to change that much for us. They still got in them what was said by Aristotle during the fourth century BC, that we were inferior, that we would never be capable of self-governance. Please, I beg us all, stay on point and nail them and not be a, of a shotgun with blasts and pellets all over the place, but not hitting the target. But if we could take the rifle approach, then we are ahead and we're on top of the game. 
I, I would say this that if I have to go, but if the committee would like to talk with me further, just you know, you know how to reach me. And uh, and in particular, if you would like, you know, my students to research anything in particular, you have a competent staff there, uh, obviously. But uh, if you would want that, just let me know, and we can quite sure we can accommodate that. But I do have to leave be before they knock down my door. I'm sorry. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, yes. So I, I did have a, a question for Rory Brooks, but I understand that you have to leave. But just uh, putting on go record, ahead. Go ahead, please. I had a comment about footnote 77, where it seemed as if you were, you know, in talking about the potential constitutionality of a reparations program, conflating indentured servitude with chattel slavery. And um, I wanted to make a comment and say, I think those two in, uh, institutions should not be conflated. And I still think that we can adhere to your preliminary thoughts in your testimony by instead of, you know, this program being race based, you know, lineage or based or based on the institution of slavery, that will still hold true to our mandate. But in you utilizing, you know, the institution of slavery as the means, we will see that many if not none any white people were chattel slaves in the true sense that black americans were yeah and that footnote is important because it really does talk to the constitutional and the prop 209 issue you're going to have to do that you're going to have to show that this is not race conscious and and what the the the, the book white cargo does it shows that uh Oh. Did Professor Brooks cut out? Or it's probably fine. It sounds like he really needed to go anyway. So okay, that's fine. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Howard. I would like to yield to you if you had any closing comments before we go to break. Yeah, I would just like to state that um, the legal question uh, is one that you you allow lawyers to fight out. It should not be uh, something that should limit uh, what amount of redress you offer or what amount of redress you present to the California Assembly to uh, to fund. Uh, there's a framework uh, that we will offer, uh, international framework, is one that uh, is enshrined in the legislation. Uh, the compensation that seems to have been uh, so much focused on today is only one aspect of reparations. Uh, certainly, we are in total agreement uh, that it should be a part of, of any type of reparations proposal package that comes out of the, the task force as well as the federal government. But there are generational crimes that will continue for generational uh, injuries, I'm sorry, that will continue for generations if those are not fully addressed and compensation cannot address those. So that's why a full repairative uh, uh, package and framework is necessary for us to look at all the ways in which uh, reparative initiatives should be brought to our people so that these harms are not perpetuated in the future. Uh, final thing is the aspect of, of um, that uh, brother uh, Dr. Scott Lewis brought up. In this document, we talk about the four classes of criminals. Governments is just one. State and local and uh, federal governments are just one class. Also are the, the corporations in California that also played a part in some of the crimes and injuries that we suffer from today. You are tasked to also examine those. You're also tasked to examine the institutions, whether they're religious institutions or, or educational institutions. Also, you're tasked to examine crimes committed by foundations and families, uh, where that uh, economic benefit has continued on into this day. With, and that economic benefit that, that Dr. Scott Lewis talked about uh, in the, in the uh, corporate uh, and institutional, as well as family trust funds that exist. So I, I would also encourage you to look at that well, in addition to what the state of California has, has done in policy uh, directed at Black Californians.
Thank you so much, Mr. Howard, for your expert testimony. At Chairwoman time, Moore, can you hear me? Yes, Chairwoman Mr. Moore. Yes, yes I've been waiting for, thank you. I, I've been waiting, I've been wanting to ask a question of Professor Brooks, but I'd like, at least like to get it on the record. Um, that I'm having trouble reconciling his recommendation for boarding school for black children with data in psychology, economics, and the health field that really gives pause about putting too much emphasis on education as a sort of magic bullet that will level the playing field, specifically in economics, employment and wealth inequity. Um, there are studies that are showing that it's not fixed by education. In psychology, we're seeing rates of uh, racial stress effects of mental health may be in fact higher with higher rate levels of education. Um, and then within the health field, mortality rates may be higher among folks who have, black folks who have higher levels of education. In fact, there's the classic Harvard study that showed higher mortality rates among their graduates with, um, with degrees. So, and then there's the cultural problem of um, placing our children uh, in boarding schools um, outside of the context of family socialization and community socialization. And then what percent of a percentage of children would actually be able to even get into a boarding school. So I just wanted to at least get those questions on the record. Thank you so much, Member Grills. I apologize for not recognizing you sooner while uh, Professor Brooks was still here. Vince, we're well received, especially by me. So thank you for that. Um, thank at, you. At this time, we will move on to our lunch break. Um, and we will resume at one o'clock. So I'm at public uh, to be ready to resume at 1250 so that we can start promptly at one. Thank you. Um, just a message to our attendees. Um, we're going to have to stop the broadcast so that we can restart and reconnect to the YouTube. So. Um, it's going to say that the session has ended, but just hold tight because we'll restart it as soon as we connect. To click the link again, or can they just stay on? Like, will it disconnect them? Is that what you're saying? No, it won't disconnect them. They'll just be put back into like a waiting area um, where okay. they won't be able to see the meeting and then we'll just reconnect and they should be fine. I just didn't want them to think that the meeting was over and them um, and they disconnect while we're on break. Thank you, Ms. Hurtado. We'll now go to lunch and resume at 12.50. Our hard start at one o'clock. <laughs> 